now that we're moving from Pesach towards Shavuot, and that's the time of um, personal development, I suppose the whole idea of this period is really moving from the undeveloped level, or as it's put in our sources, the human living on the animal level, towards giving of the Torah, where the human learns to live on a human level, right? That's, the, that's really the theme of this time. The um, sacrifice of the Omer that's brought on the second day of Pesach is barley, barley's animal food, whereas the breads that are brought on Shavuot seven weeks later, that is fine <coughs> sifted flour that is never given to animals. And all the, all the, the imagery, all the symbolism, if you like, all the, the patterns are really moving from <coughs> the birth of the Jewish people as an undeveloped child, where the child really has his own personal <coughs> motivations, vested interests, does not think beyond himself to the mature level of development. That's what we're going through now. And of course, one of the themes is our development, not only as individuals, but also relationship with Hashem, with God. Let's take a look at a, a, a basic subject here, which is a bit more perhaps ambitious than, than usual number of layers here will take some, some thought, but if you have the energy to concentrate on, on the steps, then let's try to go through it. You, you have the you have energy? <coughs> you look very enthusiastic. <laughs> Alright, let, let's make the effort. You know that... I mean, there are many ways you can, you can say this, but one of the mysteries of the beginning of this process, which is Pesach, one of the mysteries is really what matzah means. You know, matzah, many questions. I mean, why is it called really the festival of matzah, Chaga Matzot? There's many other mitzvahs as well in the, in the festival. Why is it called primarily that? Why, what, is, what is the deep meaning of matzah? And why is it relevant all year round as well? <clears throat> Another way you could put this is, that the matzah that we eat on Pesach really has a paradoxical, a paradoxical meaning. You know that matzah is at one and the same time the bread of affliction, and yet it's also the bread of freedom, right? Are you, are you aware of that? They ate it as slaves in Egypt, right? And the reason is because it's hard to digest, it's cheap food, you know, it's, what, it's food you give to slaves. The matzah is really, is really the bread of affliction. In fact, it's called lechem oni. Lechem oni means the bread of poverty. It means poor bread, poor bread. It has no, right, it is, anyone who speaks Hebrew knows that the word matzah means to break. Matzah means conflict, strife, right? Ki yinatsu anashim means when people strive. Matzah umuriva in Hebrew means strife and, 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 and battle. Matzah means breakdown. That's what it means. Matzah has all of that. And yet matzah is called the bread of freedom, which is very paradoxical. You leave Egypt, and it's a celebration of the fact that there was no time for the dough to rise. And if we take it out with us as the symbol and the food, <coughs> food always means in Torah, by the way, something that builds you. Food isn't only a symbol. You know, it's a cultural sort of a thing. You're Italian, you eat, you know, pizza, and you're South African, you eat biltong, you know. It's not that. Food is much more than a symbol. Food is what you are, right? The food is, is the method by, by which you attach your soul to your body. Right? Therefore, it's much deeper than... It's not simply a practice. <coughs> not that any practice in Judaism is only symbolic. But And therefore, we have this duality. You leave Egypt and the matzah is the bread of freedom. Right? You know, if you ask a child, ask anyone, what's the reason we eat matzah on Pesach? The reason is, there was no time for the dough to rise. Correct? That means that matzah became a reality the morning when they left Egypt because the bread wasn't able to rise. So many of the mystical commentators, the Shla and Rabbi Yitzchak, Isaac Chava and Rabbi Chaim Vital, they all ask an obvious question. The question is that although the matzah we eat because we left Egypt in a hurry, the Torah says, Ba'erev tochlu matzot. At, in the evening you have to eat matzah, meaning the Jewish people are sitting at the final portentous moment of the, of the Seder in Egypt just before they are about to go free and there's a commandment to eat matzah. Command not to eat matzah. Matzah only became a reality the next morning because the dough didn't rise. Why were they given the mitzvah to eat it before? You see clearly there's an issue of eating matzah in Egypt before freedom as a symbol or a, or a manifestation of slavery and breakdown. 
and yet you go out of Egypt and it becomes the bread of freedom. I mean, there's many, many ideas here. One fundamental idea I don't want to deal with this evening is that there's one of the core, core understandings in Judaism is that the problem must become the solution. The problem, this is what you call elegant solutions. Elegant solutions are where the problem turns out to be the solution. A non-elegant solution is where the problem, Baruch Hashem, is over now. We, the bad times are over now, the good times start. That's not the Jewish process. The Jewish process is the bad times must be shown to be the good times. Of course, the deep reason for that is Achtus Hashem. Hashem is one. And therefore, we don't have a breakdown of bad stuff and then good stuff afterwards. We have a conversion, a, trans, a transmuting of the bad into good. And Matzah fits both sides of the divide. But those are some of the issues. But let's see if we can go into this a little bit more deeply. There's an amazing, amazing lesson here. Something that if really genuinely understood could change your life forever. The Gemara says in one place, in a tractate called Horius, the Gemara says like this. What was the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people? <coughs> Stay with me carefully. What was the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people? The Gemara has a discussion. For certain reasons I'm not going to go into now, not relevant, the Gemara needs to track the first mitzvah, commandment given to the Jewish people. So the Gemara says the first mitzvah was idolatry. Because when God spoke to us, when Hashem spoke to us at Sinai, the first words that He said were, I am Hashem, and you shall have no false gods before me, which means... Yeah, the, f- the first formal commandment is you shall have no other gods. The first statement is I am Hashem. That's not really a statement of a commandment. You shall or you shall not. That's a simply statement of His being. So the command decides possibly the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people was the commandment of I am Hashem. Then the Gemara says that's impossible. Because the Jewish people were given mitzvahs before. Why? Because at a place called Mara, right? Mara, which was one of the places they stopped at after crossing the ocean, they were given ten mitzvahs. Ten mitzvahs. They were given Shabbat there. They were given, Rashi says, Parah Aduma, the, the red heifer. They were given the set of laws that are known as Mishpatim, which basically means civil damages and personal interaction laws, what you call, in English you call it tort or delict. Right? That's what you call it. In, in, if, you're a, if you're a lawyer and you speak Latin, then that's what you call it. But basically that area, because it says in the Torah, Sham there Hashem gave them Chok Mishpat. Chok in Hebrew is always the quintessential laws that cannot be understood, namely the red heifer. And Mishpat means the, the laws you can understand, let's say. And therefore, at this place, in other words, the timeline was like this. The Jewish people were in Egypt. They left Egypt. They were freed. Seven days later, they crossed the ocean. Shortly after that, three days later, they come to a place called Mara. At Mara, they were given ten mitzvot. And 49 days after leaving Egypt, they were given the rest of the Torah. Therefore, says the Talmud, the first mitzvah the Jewish people were given was not the mitzvahs given at Sinai, because if you go back some weeks, you get to a place called Marah, which is a place they passed after the Exodus, and there they were given mitzvot. And those mitzvahs preceded the ones they were given at Sinai. And therefore, the first mitzvah could not have been what they were given at Sinai, because there were mitzvahs given before. Never given these mitzvahs by God to the whole Jewish, just like uh, a mini Sinai. Yes. Or not a mini, the same. A premonition of. I've never heard of this before now. There's, Dave, there's lots of things you, you haven't heard of. But, <laughs> but um, I'm afraid this is one of them. Yeah. The Talmud says clearly, and it's based on a verse, Sham, Samloi, Choyko, Mishpat. There, God gave them laws and, and edicts. That's what it says. Through, through Moshe Rabbeinu. Yes, yes. Did yes. he go up on top of a mountain? No, no, no. No was, mountain involved. No, but he was, prof- he was announced to him as a prophet without climbing the mountain at this place called Mara. And they were given the mitzvahs. That's what it says. And nobody argues about this. Okay, but that's not our problem this evening. Stay, stay tuned to see where the problem is. <laughs> stay, stay with me. Listen well. well. I'm having enough trouble with him. What's your problem? That's the problem. That's the problem. <laughs> that's the issue. Very good question. Very good question. They should. You'll all be asking that question. So let, let's get it clear again. Stay focused with me. Here's the timeline. Here's the Jewish people in Egypt, okay? 210 years of slavery. They're freed. After that, seven days later, they cross the ocean. Shortly after that, they come to Mara. At Mara, you know what Mara means? Bitter. Bitter waters. There they drank water that was bitter, and Hashem showed Moshe how to throw a bitter tree into the bitter waters, and the sweetened, that sweetened the water. The problem became the solution. Okay? And then they drank sweet water. And at that place called Mara, which means bitterness, they were given mitzvot. Ten mitzvahs. Then, weeks later, they came to Sinai. They were given the whole Torah. 
So the Gemara says, oh, so the first mitzvah given could not have been the mitzvah at Sinai, because weeks before that they were given mitzvahs at Marah. Why God needed to give some mitzvahs before all the mitzvahs later, a question, but they were given then. And therefore the Gemara says, right, the first mitzvah was not Sinai, there were mitzvahs given before. And it continues with its discussion. Famous rabbi called the Briskarov, in his, known as the Gris, in his book on the Torah, asks your question. He says, why on earth does the, does the Gemara say that the mitzvahs that were given before were the mitzvahs at Mora? Go back to the beginning, they were given mitzvahs in Egypt. Surely if you're going to tell me there were mitzvahs given before Sinai, go back to the beginning. When the Jews were in Egypt, they were given mitzvahs. Which mitzvahs were they given in Egypt? HaChodesh HaZelachem. This is the first of the months, which is the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh. Chodesh in Hebrew means Chadash. That means it was new. It was the first thing that was given. Right? And in this fact, it's a Jewish obligation to count the months from Nisan. Do you know that many observant Jews will refuse to write a date in English? They will not sign a check the first of the 7th, 2011. You're not allowed to count by non-Jewish months. You can't call it the seventh month. You're not allowed to do that. It's not the seventh month. The first month is Nisan, not January. And so to write the 15, 1501, 2011, you know, you shouldn't do that. This is not 01. Nisan is 01. It's not the worst prohibition. You know, adultery is worse. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but there are people who are fussy. If you can, by the way, you should rather write the 1st of January. You can call it January. No problem with that. Right? So some Roman name is okay. That's a non-Jewish month. But don't call it the 1st. Not the first month. Sometimes you can't do this electronic form and you keep trying to put January in and it keeps going, oh, you know. Okay, so like you're not going to get your Iran ticket or you're not going to... Why do you have Rosh Hashanah and Nisan? Because it's also Rosh Hashanah. There's also Nisan and Rosh Hashanah. But the Torah is the Torah, the seventh month. Your problem is, why is it called the first of the beginning of the year? So, at peak Kabbalah, it was in that month that the world was conceived, but it was only born six months later. It was only born in Nisan. Yeah? That's when the Jewish people were born, that's when the year was born. There was a conception in the mind of God six months before. But that's not our problem. That's not our problem. So, again, stay with me. The Jewish people in Egypt were given mitzvahs. They were given Achorish Azalachem. They were given Pesach, Matzah, Maror. They were given mitzvahs in Egypt. So, what's the Gemara thinking? It says like this Don't tell me the first mitzvah was given at Sinai. Because if you go back a few weeks, they were given mitzvahs before. Go back a couple of weeks before that. They were given lots of mitzvahs. Do you hear the question? And he has no answer. He has no answer. Right? Mystery. Of course, the Gemara's answer is good enough. All the Gemara wants to prove is there were prior mitzvahs. So Mara is good enough. But surely if you're going to go back to a prior mitzvah, go back to the beginning. Somehow the Gemara wants to ignore the mitzvahs given in Egypt as not being fitting to provide it as an answer. Are we clear on the question? Do, do we understand the problem? Okay. That's our challenge. Evidently, when you go back to look for mitzvahs that were the precursor mitzvahs where the giving of the Torah began, you go back tomorrow. Mitzvahs given after leaving Egypt. You don't want to go back to mitzvahs given in Egypt for some reason. Why? Okay. Now, here's, here's a very interesting thing. The Rambam, the Rambam, has a section in which, you know that the Rambam Maimonides codified the whole Torah, right? Not only the mitzvahs that are operate today, like you have, for example, in the Code of Jewish Law. He codified everything, the laws of the Messiah and the laws of the Temple and the laws of the Messianic era and all sorts of laws like that. And in one famous section, the Rambam gives you the laws, the background of mankind's laws, and finishes by giving you the laws that apply to mankind today, not to Jews, to mankind, right? These are known as the seven Noahide laws. If you're a non-Jew, you're also bound by Torah. Torah is a universal document. It binds everyone. But it gives seven laws for mankind, seven general laws for mankind. And Jews have an additional, let's call it 613 mitzvahs, that Jews have additionally, which is our unique part that we have to walk in the world. Here's the Ramam's introduction. Listen to what he says. The Ramam says like this, that before he delineates all the mitzvahs and all the categories and details of non-Jewish commandments, obligations, he says like this, Nitz Adam Harish Adam, Adam, Nitz Tava B'Shesh Mitzvahs. Adam was commanded six mitzvahs. And he says what they were. Idolatry, um, c- prohibition of cursing, right? Hashem, um, stealing, sexual crimes, debatable whether adultery fits under sexual crime or under stealing. Is adultery a sexual problem? Or is adultery theft? Interfering in someone else's relationship, right? But never, yeah, whichever, whichever those it fits into, and um, 
<coughs> stealing, one's not allowed to steal. There's an obligation called dinim, that non-Jewish society is obliged to set up a system of law and order. And he lists six mitzvahs that were given to non-Jews. Then he says, <coughs> Noah was given an additional mitzvah. Which mitzvah was Noah given after the flood? Animals. Not to eat the limb of a living animal. Not to tear a piece of an animal while it's alive. Right? And, and eat the limb that's called Ever Menachai. And Noah was given the seventh of humankind's mitzvahs. And that's why we call them the Noahide laws, right? They call the mitzvot b'nei Noah. These are called the mitzvahs of the Noahides. We don't call them the Adam mitzvahs, Adam because he was only given six. Just after the flood, if you think about it, really all humans on earth today are descendants of Noah. Because Adam's progeny was destroyed in the flood. The only one who survived was Noah and his children. So all human beings who are alive today are children of Noah. So if you're not Jewish, we call you a son of Noah. Ben Noah, we say. So the Bnei Noach, the non-Jews, have seven mitzvahs. There are the six mitzvahs given to Adam, and the seventh that was given to Noah, <coughs> and that is called the Noahide system. As a complete aside, which I'm not going to talk about this evening, there are non-Jews who obse- observe these laws. You know that? There's a church called the Noahide Church. You know about them? Very interesting. A, a group of fundamentalist Christians in Tennessee, who many years ago were unsatisfied with some questions they had on Christianity. They found a rabbi in Baltimore, They asked him some questions about the Torah, and they discovered that the Torah has instructions for non-Jews. They went back to Tennessee, they took the steeple off their churches, they took all the crucifixes out of their church, and they founded a system called the Noahide Noahide Law. And boy, if you think Jewish Balei Tshuva have trouble with their families, (laughs) right? you should only know what goes on with these fundamentalist Christians and their Christian families when they tell them that they've now become Noahides, and they've been taught by Jews. But there, Rabbi Bulman used to go and teach them how a non-Jew should learn Chumash. Right? And some of them convert. I've met young men from that community who've converted to Judaism, and some don't convert. They practice the Noahide religion. That's a very fascinating issue. You can look it up yourself, and you'll see, <coughs> see a fascinating thing. But those are called the Noahides. Then the Rambam says like this. Then came Abraham. Avram Avinu came, and he was commanded in Brit Milah, circumcision. Abraham founded the idea. He was commanded to circumcise himself. And then as an aside, he says, and he prayed the morning prayer, Shacharit. Why he adds that in at this point is interesting, but he does. Then he said, Yitzchak came along and he gave Maiser. Yitzchak gave a tenth of his possessions, right, away. From that we have the mitzvah and the concept of giving away a tenth to charity. Then he says, Yaakov came on the scene, and he says he prayed an afternoon prayer. Yaakov came on the scene, and he was given another mitzvah, namely, what was Yaakov's mitzvah? Gidon Asher. Not eating the sinew of the thigh, right, the hind quarter. He was given that in the battle against the angel. So you have now ten mitzvahs. And then he says, Ube Mitzrayim, and in Egypt, Nitztave Amram, Amram was commanded, by mitzvahs Yaseros, with more mitzvahs, he doesn't say which ones, Achibah Moshe, until Moses came along, Benishlam et al Yadoi, and the Torah was completed by him. Okay? So get the sequence again. Adam was commanded six mitzvahs, Noah was commanded a seventh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob commanded more mitzvahs, and then in Egypt, Amram, Moses' father, who was the leading sage of the generation, Amram was commanded in more mitzvahs. It doesn't say which ones. Amram was commanded more mitzvahs until Moshe came and completed the Torah. So he says. Anything strike you as strange about that Amram being given mitzvahs in Egypt? Very strange. Where did the Rambam get that from? There's no record of that. The Rambam's every word is collated and collected from Torah sources. There's no Torah source that says Amram was given mitzvahs. Amram, Moses' father? What mitzvahs he was given? And all the commentaries on the Rambam struggle enormously with this. Amram was given mitzvahs? Where? Maybe he was given mitzvahs. Where does the Torah say? So the Rambam can't make it up. Some say one of the answers to this difficult question is he was given the mitzvah of Kiddushi. Marriage. Jewish marriage. How do we know? Where do we get that from? Because he separated from his wife. Because having children was a cruel thing to do, he felt. Because Pharaoh was drowning all the male children. So he said to his wife, it's wrong to have children. Until his little daughter Miriam, who was six years old, said to him, Abba, you're not bringing girls into the world either that way. And he said, you're right. So he took back his wife. And who was born from that? Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu. Not bad for little girls. Little girl's advice. And that's how he was born, right? But since he took back his wife at that point, maybe the mitzvah of getting married or remarried 
But people struggle enormously with this. Where did the Rambam see that Amram was given mitzvahs in Egypt? Where did he get that from? It is very challenging. Okay, that's, that, that, that's the problem. A few months ago, my Rebbe happened to be in a certain place in Israel, and somebody <coughs> who's an expert in rare manuscripts and collects old books and manuscripts came up to him and showed him an amazing document. <laughs> this was an old book that is known as the Korban Asanel. Korban Asanel was one of the great early authorities of the latter period of Jewish history, lived maybe 200 or 300 years ago. He was a rabbi in Karlsruhe, and he was one of the great giants of Torah thought and law at that time. And his copy of the Rambam has notes. His notes and emendations and, and edition changes are listed in his copy of the Rambam. And he showed this copy of the Rambam, and the Korban Asanel has there a note changing the edition. And in his Rambam, it doesn't say Nitztava Amram, it says Nitztavu Imahem. Now in Hebrew, the word Amram needs only one drop of ink to be translated. Just one speck of ink missing on the document would change that word. The word Amram, if you write that in Hebrew, right? Amram, the resh in Hebrew, if you put one extra dot under the resh, it becomes Imahem. Which now reads like this. Not that Amram was given mitzvahs, but the Jewish people in Egypt were given mitzvahs together with them. Imahem, with them. Meaning, with all the previous mitzvahs. Meaning, Adam was given six, Noah was given one, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as individuals were given three more, and together with them, with that set of mitzvahs, the Jewish people in Egypt were given more mitzvahs. What does this mean? Of course, you have to change one other letter too. Because Nitztave Amram becomes Nitztavu Imahem. That's, that's his change, okay? What does this mean? He said when he saw this, the whole house filled with light, he said it changed everything. Yeah. What does it mean? What does that subtle, subtle change mean? So for this we need to understand the Zohar, right? The Zohar, Kabbalistic work, as you all know, the Zohar says a, a very, very interesting thing. The Zohar says like this, it's in Parshas Vayetze, Kufnun Zayin, those who want to look it up. The Zohar says, Rabbi Chir and Rabbi Yossi were traveling, two of the great sages of the Talmudic era, and the one of them said to the other one, let's learn Torah, because when we're traveling and we learn Torah, miracles happen around us, God does miracles for us, and He bonds with us, therefore let's learn. So he began, and he said like this, now, I'm not going to try to explain every word here, because obviously we're dealing with Kabbalistic wisdom here, and every word has a world of explanation that's necessary. But I want to just tell you what it says and isolate the part that we need. It says like this. When the Jewish people were in Egypt, they were eating matzah. Matzah is called lechem oni. That means the bread of poverty. Okay? And as I said, matzah means breakdown, poverty, poorness, struggle, strife. And that, says the Zohar, was a woman without a man. That's what it says. The female without the male. It was the female without the male, which is what's called miskanusa. Miskanusa means abandoned, pathetic, right? without a partnership. That was what they were, that was what was happening in Egypt. When they left Egypt, Hashem gave them the gift of togetherness. That means a bond. The bond in Hebrew is always signified Kabbalistically by the letter Vav. Vav in Hebrew is the letter that means and. In English it's called a conjunction, it means it joins. In Hebrew, the word vav means a hook, something that joins. The Jewish people were given the gift of Hashem's togetherness with us, and the vav put into matzah makes it mitzvah. It says, the Zohar says, matzah became mitzvah. Matzah became mitzvah. Because if you write the word matzah with a vav inside, it becomes mitzvah. That's why the Torah says, Ushmartem et hamatzot. You shall guard the, mat- the matzot, the matzahs. Be careful that they don't become chomets and leavened. Says the Gemara, Ushmartem is hamitzvahs. Read that as God the mitzvahs. Matzot, mitzvot, in Hebrew the same word. And then it goes on to explain what it means, the male and the female together, and that's called King David, and that's called the, the Malchus, and what happens to the moon, and it's a whole, whole discussion which we can't go into now. What, what, what does this all mean? That matzah became mitzvah? What, what, what does this mean? Before you even think into this, anyone with any Hebrew background should know, right? 
that the word matzah means separation and breakdown. The word mitzvah means togetherness. Mitzvah means together. You know, we translate mitzvah as commandment. But that's not really, that's not really accurate. In simple Hebrew, if you want to give the word for commandment, you say tzivui. Tzivui is a commandment, right? The commander gives the soldier an order, that's called a tzivui. One of the words you can use. Mitzvah is a very interesting word. Mitzvah in Hebrew means a commandment, but it makes a togetherness. But tzavta chad in Aramaic, tzavta means a togetherness. In modern Hebrew, you have the word sevet, the same root. Sevet means a crew, people who function as a team. Right? Mitzvah means somehow <clears throat> that when one person commands another one, and in obeying the commandment they become one, that's called mitzvah. By the way, Hebrew has that construction many times. <coughs> For example, in Hebrew, when you take a word that indicates an agent and a recipient, and then you put them together, you put a mem in front. For example, let's say you have a shofet, that's called a judge. And then you have a nishpat, the person who's being judged. When you put them together, it's called mishpat. Mishpat means the process of the one and the other coming together, you put a mem in front. Or you have what's called a malve, a lender. You have a love, a, barrier, a, b- a borrower. When you put them together, you get milve, the loan. Hebrew is amazing. It's, it's enough to make you religious. I mean, it's, you know, it, the, the, way the, the way the letters construct the ideas, right? When you put a word, you want to you take one agent operating with another one such that they come together to make a new thing, you put the mem in front, right? So mitzvah means you have a commander, a mitzvah, you have a nitzvah, the one who's commanded. When you put them together, you get a thing called mitzvah. What does mitzvah mean? Mitzvah means when one commands and one obeys and the two become one unit, then you've got what's called mitzvah. Right? What does this mean? There's two ways you can command somebody. There's one way you can command where the commander gives an instruction and the one who's commanded carries out the instruction. Does that put him together? No. The general of the army commands a soldier what he has to do. The soldier goes and does it. Does it mean he becomes one in a loving, intense relationship with the commander? No, he probably hates him. If they follow their orders, he's probably going to die. That's called a command, a tzivui. But a mitzvah means that the one gives an instruction, the, the one who's commanded follows it out, and they become one, they become a team, they become bonded in oneness. Right? That's what the word mitzvah means. When the Jewish people were in Egypt, they were given what's called sivuyim. They were given, command, they were given instructions, like the non-Jewish world. The non-Jewish world has instructions, moral imperatives. Right? Don't kill, don't steal, etc. Does that bond you with God? No, not necessarily. Yes, you're a good person. And it means you take care of the world as it should be. Does that mean you become one with Hashem? Not necessarily. When the Jewish people left Egypt, a whole new world opened up. The male and female, you know, the seven weeks after leaving <coughs> Egypt is called the day of their marriage. That's what it's called. Leaving Egypt is called the day of birth. You know that. Leaving Egypt is called the time of birth. In fact, if you follow it carefully, you don't want to speak too much about this, in the deep Kabbalistic commentaries, you see that leaving Egypt was a sort of a conception, and seven days later, the sea was a birth. <coughs> Why was it a birth? The sea splitting, say the Kabbalists, is a woman's waters breaking. Why are the Jewish people born in the sea? Why are the Jewish people had to go through the sea to be born? When the sea split, it's like, you know, why were the Jewish people born in the sea that split? People think, well, they had to escape. They had to escape. So the sea opened. They didn't cross over. If you look at the map, you'll see there's no place to escape to. The Midrash says they went into the ocean and came out on the same side. The point was to go into the ocean and to have the water split. Right? What does that mean? There's much more detail on this, but what it means is something like this. The world began in water. The world. Hashem created a, a, a context that was only water. Water always means the shapeless void. Water always means, water in Torah is the perfect medium that has no shape. Water takes no shape. Water has no shape of its own, right? Water, in fact, the Maral points out many times, water is completely shapeless material. That's why you can't even say, you know that in Hebrew, there's no singular for water. Water is always plural. It has no singularity. Water is always plural. If there is a singular to water, mayim, the singular is ma. Ma means what? What is always the word you use in Torah where the thing has so little form, you can't even begin to say what its form is, so you simply say, what is it? What? Ma in Hebrew, okay? The word what in Hebrew is a very, very significant word. Ma adds up to 45, exactly the same number as Adam, the human being, 
And the same letters as Adam spell Ma'od. Ma'od means more. The human being is always more than whatever it is, there's more there. Right? How much more? All you can say is what? Again, when you, when you know what a thing is, you can say what it is. When you don't know what a thing is, you simply say what is it. For example, example, when the manna fell, the manna fell in Egypt, in, in the desert. The manna was so spiritual that nobody could say what it was. So they called it, what is it? They called it, they called the manna, what is it? In Hebrew, man means what is it? The Ramban says the man was crystallized shechina. The man, the manna, was divine presence crystallized. You can't name that. So they called it what? This is called what? Okay. What always means something that invokes more that you can't say what it is. What's fascinating, very, it's a complete speculation, I'll just leave it with you as a thought. In many languages in the world, water has the same structure. In Hebrew, you have ma, the plural mayim is water. In Dutch and Afrikaans and all those languages, you have vat, which means what? And vater is water. In the Germanic languages, you have vas, which means what? And wasser, which is water. Even in Latin, you have qua, which means what? And aqua, which is water. That's not accident. Right? These languages are sparks and splinters of Hebrew. The original spiritual language splintered into all languages, and you see the spiritual ideas coming through again and again. Right? So water is a substance that you can't say what it is, and it's just much of that. Right? It has no... So what does Hashem do? He creates a world of water, and then He splits the waters. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place. Let the dry land be revealed. And on that dry land, Adam is created. What does it mean? The waters of void, void of form, are splitting. And solid dry land, which is a suitable medium for a human being, is created. And Adam is created on the dry land. What happens a few generations later? People pervert their way on the world. What, has, what happens? A flood. What does a flood mean? The world is returned to the void of water, and we start a second edition of humanity. By the way, the Gemara says, in the days of Enosh, Enosh was an early human being who foisted idolatry on the world. A third of the world was flooded. It means a third of the world needed to be put back into that void form of water. Finally, mankind goes bad again. Hashem says, back to the drawing board, we go back to water. Water is the, is the medium void of form. Then, this, after the flood, one man survives in Noah's second edition of humanity. Mankind perverts its way in the world again, and Hashem says, we're going to try a third edition of humanity, and that's called the Jewish people. And they go into the ocean, and the ocean splits, and there's a new dry land formed, and there's a third edition of humanity, and that's us. Right? The meaning, the reason the Jewish people were formed in the split ocean is because that's exactly what a birth is. It's no accident that the child is held in the womb in a bag of water. By the way, you know, again, Hebrew says it all, that when the child is in the mother's womb, the child's <coughs> underwater. Not? That water in Hebrew is called shfir, shafir. Hebrew, the membranes that circle the child are called shfir, and the liquid is called mei shafir. The Hebrew word <coughs> shafir, a fascinating word, it always means, the word shafir means, in English, in English you call it amniotic fluid. Right? What does amniotic fluid mean? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Shafir in Hebrew always means, that root in Hebrew, shin peiresh, means to go back to a pure origin. For example, the word shafir in Hebrew is also the word le shaper. Shaper means to develop and build and improve. Right? Shipru ma'asechem, improve. Shapir means beautiful. Like shipir in Yerushalayim, beautiful ones of Yerushalayim. Adam was called shapir. Shapir means beautiful. The Hebrew, the Hebrew name is shapiro, shapira, comes from this root, which means beauty, beautiful, right? The, um, the word shofar in Hebrew is the same root. Because when you blow the shofar, you're going back to the root of who you are as a human being. That's why it's a wordless scream. On Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar. Why? Because words are inadequate. Words are always inadequate. The words may be incredible, but they never can say the whole thing. You can always misunderstand words, but you can never misunderstand the meaning of a scream of a child in the night. The shofar is the scream, the wordless scream of a soul longing to be redeemed. The blowing of the shofar means going back to the, the state of a fetus, right? Before there's any formation. And all these words are the same thing. The Jewish people are formed in the ocean because it's a... This gives you just a small insight into what mikveh is. What is a mikveh? A mikveh is a person going into water that has to be natural. The law of a mikveh is the water must be natural water, not, not carried. It must be seawater or a river or water melted from snow or rainwater, it's got to be natural water. When you go under that water and got completely immersed, not even one hair must be out, 
You're under the water is a complete dissolution of previous form. When you come out of the water, uh, the commentaries say that the intention for purity when you go into the mikveh, when you've been contaminated, whether it's through menstruation as a woman or a man touching certain things connected with death, whatever the contamination is, when you go under the water, the intention is dissolution of form. And when you emerge from the water, is the intention of being born again. Right? Everybody knows this in Christianity. The way the person gets born again is, is baptism. Where do they come from? Where do they come from? It's mikveh, right? It's a mikveh. The idea is to be immersed, to go back into the primordial waters that are formless, and then to emerge from the waters. That's what the birth of a child is. It's when the waters break, and the Jewish people emerge from Egypt, and seven days later they go through that process, which is the process of birth, right? And that is the... That's what it says, Hechim Teva Ladosa. Hashem prepared dry land for His people, that is the Jewish people, who are born in this transition, this moving into the ocean, in which, of course, the Egyptians cannot survive, right? That's not their medium. And therefore, and therefore, the leaving Egypt is a categorical moment. Leaving Egypt transmutes us from being humans, non-Jews, to being a nation that has a different sort of relationship with God. You know, you can say this another way. One of the fundamental questions about leaving Egypt is that you don't you almost need to know nothing about Judaism to know that that's a fundamental defining statement, defining moment of who we are. For example, almost everything in Torah we say Zecha Litsiyas Mitzrayim. Zecha Litsiyat Mitzrayim as a commemoration of going out of Egypt. Right? Everything. Mitzvahs. Putting on fill in, we say that. Not taking interest when you give a loan. Yeah, all dozens of mitzvahs in the Torah we say Zecha Litsiyas Mitzrayim, commemorating the going out of Egypt. And an obvious question with that is, why did we go back to Sinai? Sinai was the pinnacle. Sinai was our love relationship. He should kiss us with the kisses of his mouth, as it says in Chirashi. That's called Yom Chasunasu, the day of the wedding. Surely you go back, any person who has a, in a marital relationship, what is the point you go back to? You go back to the day of your marriage. You don't go back to the day of your engagement. There was a minor tragedy. There was a major, I mean, there was a, a minor event. Compared to the major event of, of the, there was a preparation, a setting out on a journey. When you get to the culminating moment, which is called marriage, the Jewish people go back in history. We don't get back to the Sinai moment where we bonded in love and unity with Hashem. We go back to the preparatory moment of leaving Egypt. Why? Surely the whole of Judaism should go back to the great moment of Sinai, <coughs> where we met God and He revealed Himself. We don't do that. Leaving Egypt was only an inference about God's existence. We saw miracles, but we didn't see Him. The Egyptians also saw the miracles. But when we got to Sinai, there we met him personally. And yet we don't hark back to that moment. We always, and the reason is, leaving Egypt was our defining moment. When we left Egypt, something radical occurred. We moved from the world of fulfilling commandments as instructions to the world of fulfilling commandments as bonding with the one who commands. The reason that the Gemara says Mara was mitzvahs given before, before Sinai <laughs> was because those were mitzvahs. Those were mitzvahs after leaving Egypt, after crossing the ocean, we were given mitzvahs. Going back into Egypt, those weren't mitzvahs in the sense, of course, later they all became mitzvahs. When we stood at Sinai, then everything was ratified into becoming a mitzvah. But the mitzvahs that were given in Egypt, Imahem, they were instructions that were given together with the non-Jewish mitzvahs. They were given all the mitzvahs in Egypt in the same, in the same format as instructions. They were fulfilling them as non-Jews fulfilling instructions. But after they left Egypt and they, they crossed that divide and they crossed the ocean and they became a people who now fulfill a mitzvah as an act of bonding with the one who commands. <coughs> and that's where a whole different category begins. You have to understand when you do a mitzvah here, you're not fulfilling an instruction. You're becoming part of the one who instructs. Your intention, in a, you know, virtually all the mitzvahs are physical actions. I challenge you to think of more than three or four mitzvahs that are not physical actions in the world. Maybe love of Hashem, fear of Hashem. Virtually every one of 613 mitzvahs is a physical action. In every part of the body. The meaning is that you're doing a physical action in the lowest of worlds, the physical world, and in that way you bond. Now the Swas Emes says, puts it like this. You could say it many ways, but he puts it this way. What is the meaning of Tselem Elohim? That means created in the image of God. What does that mean? You look like God? So the Swas Emes says, Tselem Elohim means like this. Imagine... <laughs> way beyond our level of capacity to imagine, there's a thing called the Ratzon Hashem, God's desire. What does He want? He wants a certain thing done in the world. 
What does he do? He brings it down until it's a commandment. But he doesn't do it. He leaves it as an instruction. And he says, and you step in. And you step in. And you develop in your mind the same desire that he has. His desire was a certain thing to be done in the world. You step in. That's called Asay Ritzon Charitzon. Make your will his will. And you formulate in your mind the same thing that he has in his mind. And you carry it out. So the Svasem is, you close the circuit at that moment when you become part of the one who commands. Hashem is the one who wants a certain thing done. He brings it down to instruction. You then become the one who wants that thing, just like he does. You're the microcosm of the whole system, and you carry it out. And his will is done by you, and you become part of him. Of course, when you stand there and you decide, don't tell me what to do, I'm going to stand here. I never mind your commandments, I'll do what I want in the world. Oh, you feel amazing at that point, because now you define your own reality. But at that moment, you just cease to be. Because you just stepped out of the loop of reality. So now you have this incredible illusion. Well, I'll make up my own rules. But at that moment, you cease to be. And not only are you accountable for that, you're accountable for the chain of reality that is not being closed, not being completed. Because there's an instruction that's not being fulfilled now. Maturity means not doing what you want to do, doing what God wants, but wanting it yourself. Not doing it because you're forced to do it, doing it because He wants you to do it, now you want to do it. That's called love. Love means the one who is beloved achieves the same desire as the one... Yeah, that means that there's a principle who has a desire, and the person who has bonded into that principle now formulates the same desire, and therefore my desire is yours, and what you do is actually... Yeah? Can you please say that again? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Mitzvah means, Talmud Kim means, that when Hashem wants something, Ratzon in Hebrew, he's Ratzon, Ratzon Gematria Makor, that's the source. But what he wants, he doesn't do. He only gives an instruction. You now have to want what he wants, so you have to look like him, and then you have to do. I'll give you an example. The Talmud has a question like this. The Talmud says like this, Gadol ve'ose. Greater is a person who does because he's commanded than somebody who does because he's not commanded. In other words, I have two ways I can do something spontaneously. I want to do it, so I go and do it. Well, I do it because someone commands me. Which is greater? The normal intuition is it's much better to be spontaneous. I want to help somebody, so I go out and I help them. No one's forcing me. It's an expression of who I am. Incredible thing. But when God commands me, what greatness is that? The command says you are far greater when you act in consonance with a command than when you act spontaneously. Why? There are many explanations. But the deep one is this. When you act spontaneously and do what you want to do, you can never express more than yourself. You can be who you are and you can express it. But it will never be bigger than you. But when you do what God commands you to do, you become part of the circuit that begins with infinity. Talk about bigger. Again, when you stand here and formulate what you want and you do it, it may be fine, but it's never bigger than you. But when you stand here and you do what He wants, so your point of origin is His infinite source, and you become the essential part of that that gets about in the world. And therefore you mesh into a partnership. And that's called mitzvah. Mitzvah is not an instruction. Mitzvah is not sivui. Mitzvah is not a nice thing to do because somebody made you do it. Mitzvah means that the one who wishes and the one who does have become one. In a good marriage, the two have become one. Like the elderly couple, they have been many, many years bonding to each other. They came to see my brother-in-law in Israel. He was their doctor. And they came and they sat down laboriously in front of his desk and the woman had a, a wound on her leg. And the husband learned across and he said, Doctor, we have a sore leg. <laughs> Doctor, we have a sore leg. Right. Not she or it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's mitzvah. The exodus from Egypt, right? Matzah became mitzvah. Matzah, the symbol of breakdown, the bread of poverty the food of strife and dissonance became mitzvah. It's not a play on words. It means that before you were eating something that was a symbol of breakdown, now you ingest and become one with something that's called mitzvah. Yeah. And that's the defining moment of the Jewish people. And therefore, whether this edition in Rambam, you know, you have to go back and look at the old manuscripts, the handwritten manuscripts, does it say Amram, does it say Imahem? Fascinating issue. But the point is what the common son is telling you is that the mitzvah is given in Egypt well, mitzvahs like human beings have. Abraham, Isaac, Jack were individuals. They were commanded. But when the Jewish people was formed into a unity, and they went through that process of birth, and they became born as a people who manifest oneness with Hashem, 
The culmination of that is at Sinai, where the oneness was so intense they died. When they heard, heard Hashem speak, they all died. Then the Shamas flew back to their source and the bodies were, and they had to be revived and brought forward again. And that's what means kiss us with the kisses of his mouth. Sinai means a kiss. A kiss means two becoming one. Kiss always means the organ of connection, being used in connection, right? That is what it means. That began with the Exodus. And therefore, in Judaism, we go back to Zechel Itzis, we're always going back right, to that moment of exiting the world. In, in Hebrew, the word Mitzrayim adds up to the same numerical value as the word Mispar, a number. Something which is numbered. Something which is a finite number. It can be numbered. That's Egypt. You move out of Egypt and you go to a dimension that is completely beyond number. The whole process is called the counting of the Omer. Counting of Omer means we count the days. We count the days. What's the purpose? To reach a point that is beyond count. When we get to the 50th day, we don't count it. The 50th day is called Torah. The Torah says clearly, Tisperu Chamishim Yom, count 50 days. We count 49. The fifth day of, of Shavuot, we don't say a word. We count the day by not giving it a number. 50 means beyond number. 49 is always, in Hebrew, the word Midah, which means a measurement, adds up to 49. Mem, Dalet, hey, 49. 49 days. That which can be measured, Midah. Then you get to Shavuot, which is beyond measure. It cannot be numbered. The 50th doesn't mean a number. 50 means beyond all numbers. Right? And therefore the process begins in Egypt, which is a numbered system, a, a, a process of the natural, the material, right? steeped in the immoral, the material, the sensual. And the process means we exodus, we leave that. Leaving Egypt isn't like a you know, national historical sort of an event. It's a transcendent spiritual event. That's why the Rambam says the mitzvah of telling the story on the night of Pesach is to tell the children about miracles. He doesn't say the mitzvah is to tell them a, a geopolitical story that we want place in mitzvah. That's not the issue. The issue is to tell, because miracles means a breaking of the natural order. The Jewish people were living in a natural order. The commandments they were given in that environment were natural things. makes the world a better place. And then they left and they crossed and they crossed an ocean. That represents a birth. And it's a birth into a higher dimension. It's a birth where we are people of miracles. Now, our history is an abnormal history. We begin with the impossible ends. Imagine the people for that three and a half thousand years, the whole Western world has been doing little else than trying to exterminate us. And we're the only ones who are still around. It would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. That's the meaning. The reason is that, and that's the idea of mitzvah. Mitzvah is something, right? the deep sources say that Torah is the mind and mitzvah is the body. The bonding of male and female, right? In, in Torah thinking, Torah is always called the male, that's the spiritual, and mitzvah is called the body. The Torah wishes to express itself in mitzvah. That's why a person who learns Torah does not intend to fulfill it in the world, it's not considered Torah. Because, because Torah means a spiritual concept that gets expressed in the world. Which part of the world? The physical world. In fact, in Hasidic thinking, the lower the aspect of the world, the holier it can be. The lower the part of the body, the more humiliating, the more potentially animal, the holier activity can that part, that the most absurd an animal of all activities, so absurd and so humiliating that it's shameful and needs to be covered, is an area that can conceive life. No accident. The meaning is that there's a spiritual source and it has to come all the way down into bonding with the physical so that all manifests the divine oneness. And that's the meaning of mitzvah. And therefore the transition in Egypt was a transition from a world that was constrained, that was bound, that was numbered, where their only interest was Looking down, the Nile wells up and, 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 uh, and uh, irrigates the land. You move from there to a place called Israel where you've got to look up for the rain. You don't look down, you have to look up. And the rain, rain is the one thing that's unpredictable. With all the sophistication of modern you know, weather predictions and so forth, the rain is completely unpredictable. It's one of the three things Hashem himself holds the keys. It's a whole different, a whole different world. And that is the process. Therefore, becoming Jewish really means leaving the Egypt of the constrained, the finite, the numbered, where you can be a spiritual person, you can be a moral person, you can follow moral dictates and moral imperatives and make the world a better place. But that's not what we're here for. We, our task and our definition is to move into the world of miracle, that which is completely transcendent, miraculously and very paradoxically a world where you can do a physical action and become a spiritual being. Okay, we'll stop there.